Hello and welcome to the indignities of getting old. That was what we were just talking about. <laughs> Very hair related. Hi, I'm Steve Lowry, the uh, editor of the Hilo, and I'm here with Mike Guardabasio and JJ Fiddler of the 562. If you wonder why the arts guy is talking to the sports guy, when it comes to journalism, I identify as a sports writer, which I was for a number of years. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is whenever Mike and JJ come in, because finally I have someone to talk sports with <laughs> in the office. All Melissa Evans wants to talk about is the fact that the Giants won three World Series this, de- <laughs> this century. Yes, Melissa, we get it. We understand. And the Dodgers have won none. Hey, guys, your, thanks for being here. life wraps. Uh, thanks for having us, Steve. Your, I, I can sense the desperation anytime we walk in the office. Sometimes we'll just walk in and you just yell, Jackie Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I won't let you get by my desk. Stop, stop, talk to me. Talk to me. Hey, I, I wish I could say that this was planned, but actually Melissa Evans and I were talking. We said, oh, we should have a sports talk. Let's do it Monday. And now I, a, about 10 minutes ago, I realized yesterday was the Grand Prix, which for a lot of people is the defining, not just sports event, but kind of cultural event in the city. You guys obviously always cover that. What would you normally be doing on the Grand Prix, and what did you end up actually doing yesterday? Well, there's a great tradition of Jim McCallion talking about the weather for the weekend of the Grand Prix and how important the weather is going to be. So when I woke up yesterday, I looked outside and I checked the weather, and it was uh, it was gloomy in the morning, but classic Long Beach Grand Prix Sunday. It burned off. It was a beautiful afternoon, and if we were out there, we would have said, Jim was right. It was going to be sunny either way. Steve, can I let me let me cut in here and say that JJ and I and whoever our freelancers, our rotating group of freelancers are who are I'm going to tell this story, JJ, whoever's working with us uh, covering it. We always go to the media luncheon on I want to say Thursday before the race weekend. And JJ and I always take bets on how many sentences into Jim McCallion's opening remarks he will mention the weather. (laughs) <laughs> the over under is usually like 1.5. <laughs> yeah. Why is Jim so obsessed with the weather? It's never it, rained on the Grand Prix. It's, oh, it, 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 it's, okay. it's of all of the outdoor races. Um, and, you know, of the street races in America, it's obviously right at the top of the, the list. Um, famously among race people, it's they've never had a bad weather day. Wow. OK. Yeah. Kind of kept it going, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I want to let you say we haven't been disrupted by a pandemic, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, isn't that weird? Like a virus got it before it rained. Uh, who, if you'd had the odds on that. <laughs> hey, by the way, I want to let you know if you're watching and listening, please feel free to uh, send us any questions, comments. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of things. Um, that's the big event for you guys, but I think you guys would allow your absolute bread and butter is covering the high school sports here in Long Beach, which I think you can argue are probably the best as far as producing elite talent. Um, We uh, lost a lot. It's shut down for the rest of the the school year. I'm curious so far, guys, what were you looking forward to that now we'll never get to see? I I would start with, I think the top, the top single athlete is there was a girl at Wilson uh, high school named Rachel Glenn who last year won the state championship. She's a track and field athlete. She won the state championship in the, um, in the 300 hurdles last year as a junior. Uh, she was second in the state in the high jump. As a sophomore, she won the state championship in the high jump with a six-foot uh, jump, which is, as a 10th grader, the kind of mark that puts you on like an Olympic-type uh, track. Um, in the offseason, she signed a full scholarship with South Carolina, um, and she was poised to – probably move up to number two all time in Long Beach history for individual state championships one. Um, but she's someone who, you know, when JJ and I are talking in July and August of last summer about the upcoming school year, she was story number one, you know, with a bullet, just like, well, we've got the best track and field uh, girls athlete in California. Um, she's uh, one of those kids. She's really charismatic. She's a great interview. She's good on camera. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about Rachel Glenn and, you know, she was just going to have a three or four month kind of coronation here as one of the most accomplished in Long Beach history, which is saying something in that sport and most sports. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, and instead really, she, I think, I think Wilson got to one meet before the shutdown and, you know, that's it. 
it. So really, really kind of a tragedy for her and for local sports fans. Um, you know, they'll have to wait till she comes back to Mount Sac or something with South Carolina to, uh, to get a chance to see her again. Mm-hmm. How about you, JJ? Yeah, you're, you're right, Mike. That is a huge bummer. I, I just think the sport of baseball. Uh, we wrote a couple articles as the season was getting started that Long Beach baseball was going to be elite again. You know, we did the 5-6-2 classic video of uh, Chase DeYoung and Shane Watson pitching against each other at Blair Field. That was regular for us when we first started working in this city. And the talent has gone elsewhere and it's kind of been down in the Moore League. But to have the Moore League back with elite talent, uh, with Tiedemann and uh, Ryan Geck, uh, first baseman over there at Milliken, and then to also have the dirtbags be good. Like, yeah. I, w- I was ready for to basically spend five days a week in the press box at Bull Diamond at Blair Field, just right. covering Long Beach baseball. And to because lose guys, that baseball season is, I mean, it's just such a bummer. From the dirtbags. I'll, to I'll never get over that. I'm not, I mean, you know, for the dirtbags to go from their, their worst season in decades last year to rank number 17 in the country this year, um, you're right. I mean, it would have been Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, dirtbags, you know, yep. Monday, Wednesday, high school baseball. <laughs> And that's the thing, watching your reporting about the dirt bags, it wasn't like they had one nice weekend or something like that. It it seemed obvious by the time everything got shut down that they had already kind of turned it around. And of course, with the talent base here, that's readily available, right? They can if they can keep talent home, they can turn things around that quick. Absolutely. And he's get, Eric Fallon's way, the new coach over there, has just got the right type of attitude for today's athlete. Uh, other coaches at other places have had troubles kind of getting the young kids to buy into the old school ideas. Well, Eric Valenzuela isn't an old school idea guy. He's all new school. They've got a bunch of energy at practice, which if you've been to a college baseball practice before, you know, that's very rare. Uh, So to have all that energy and uh, actually have the results come and to have them come at home too. It's not like they were traveling the country and we didn't get to see them. They won all of those series at home. So yeah, that I will never forget what could have been for the 2020 dirtbags. I'll just tick off a couple other quick bullet points, Steve. Um, you know, we don't need to go as in depth as we did with uh, with Rachel at the Dirtbags in baseball, but um, the St. Anthony softball team was number one in Division Three. They have the number one infielder in America in high school in uh, Tiara Jennings, who signed with uh, the University of Oklahoma. Um, she was hit. I think she was hitting like eight hundred or something. <laughs> uh, but they were like, yeah, they. What's that? Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, they, they looked like they were going to be like a 31 and 0 CIF champion, uh, really special team, you know, among the history of St. Anthony. And then, um, the Moore league added lacrosse for the first time this year. It was the first time they'd added a new sport, uh, in 30 years since soccer in 1983. And, um, and so we were, I don't know, three weeks into the Moore league lacrosse schedule, the first one ever. Um, it looked like the poly boys were I mean, CIF championship contenders again for a brand new sport. Um, and then on the girls side, the Polly and Millican girls both look really good. The Wilson girls look good. Um, so we lose that, you know, we, we're all geared up for, we're, we're making history. There's a new sport. Um, and then in boys volleyball, uh, Wilson, Millican and Polly were all ranked in the top 10 in CIF um, and just looked like that was going to be a really fun league season. Um, we actually have the weird thing, Steve, We've been, maybe you can give us some advice on this. We have our previews that we wrote for track and field and volleyball, we literally didn't post them before the shutdown happened. So I have a 2000 word boys volleyball preview. It names all these great kids. And it's just like, do I just delete that? Or do I post it and say, we're here for commemorative sake, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I know what could have been. Hey, I want to go back to St. Anthony. The basketball team did very well too. Is there, is this just a coincidence or is there something going on at St. Anthony when this is over with that they've kind of turned a corner athletically, because obviously we always hear about the more league powers, uh, Polly pretty much in everything, Wilson and a lot like baseball and, and some of the more uh, kind of country club sports and Milliken and each of those have their specialties. I come from a small Catholic high school and I know the resources aren't always there. How are they doing what they're doing right now? Well, when we first started working together in the city about uh, 10 years ago, they were actually in danger of closing. And it was the rededication to activities and athletics uh, that, that kind of kept that school afloat. Yeah. And it was the football team, the basketball team, and I'd say probably the volleyball team. Would you agree, Mike, that those three really yeah. opened the doors to getting kids into the school that usually wouldn't have even considered going to St. Anthony? I mean, it's all about coaches, right? 
You got Mario Morales, uh, uh, Alan Cabanis, and Alicia Lamau. All three of those coaches are local, respected. People know them. They don't have to tell them who, who's calling. You know what I mean? They don't got to go knock on doors. People know who they are, and they're getting those kids. I mean, to have a football team win that CIF championship a few years ago, volleyball won a championship, baseball got to the final. You know, it, it was a, a total rededication to athletics that really saved that school. Yeah. They, um, looking forward now, um, we know things have been canceled. And I think there was this kind of expectation that, oh, okay, we'll have to go through the summer, school will start, and it'll all start again. But anybody who listens to sports talk radio, anything knows that we're already talking about college football, maybe not starting up. What are you guys hearing about high school? What will, is there some kind of um, watermark they're looking at to say, okay, we'll restart if these things are in place? Plug yeah. the podcast, Mike. Yeah, we had a, we had a half hour uh, conversation with Rob Wygod, um, who's a Wilson alum, coach at Wilson Lakewood, who's the the uh, commissioner of the CIF Southern Section. So basically, like the head honcho for high school sports in Southern California. Um, the first thing I would say, because we get that's obviously the number one question we get from fans too, right? Like, right. give me something to look forward to that, that you know reasonably. So the first thing I would say from everything JJ and I have heard from Rob Wygod um, and everyone else is. My six-year-old son will be playing baseball before Millican High School is. Millican High School probably will be playing sports before the Dodgers are, right? Like, I think people should, even though oftentimes the high school federations are looking at the pros and going, oh, well, if the NFL is not playing, then we can't play. The reality is that if people are accepting the guidelines of the state, you know, public health officials, what they're saying is the mass, mass gatherings is what have the most concern. So a little league game at, you know, El Dorado Park, it's going to be easier to put that on because it's going to be easier to tell the 30 people who are there, we want you to maintain this amount of space uh, from each other. You, it's easier to test or do temperature scans for 30 people than it is for a thousand people, 15,000 people, obviously. Um, so again, so this, this is the bright side of the fact that we're not getting as big of crowds for high school games as we did 20 years right. ago. Right? That's, yes. Very easy to space. That's exactly right. And I think what, what Commissioner Wygod said to us was um, there's some things they won't look into. Like, I don't think he will accept high school football games with no fans. Um, but he was open to the idea of maybe there's a guest list, you know, a friends and family guest list kind of a, seriously. You know, it's like, well, we could yeah. if the state says 300 people can gather for something, are we going to cancel high school football? Or are we going to play high school football with 300 people there, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think that the, the main thing is they're willing to do all of that. And it, it's clear that everyone's working towards the idea that things are going to restart in the fall. Um, I just think from everything JJ and I have heard, people should expect that it will look a little bit different than what we're used to, whether that's more screenings or less fans allowed in or whatever. But um, we're certainly – planning on having some kind of sports back late summer and, and into the fall. But why God said, and I, I, I credit him for being so candid, you know, he's talking about how some sports come back earlier than others. You know, you've got a yeah. golf that's already socially distanced and then you've got boys water polo. I, I don't, are we going to know if it's safe to be in a public pool in August? I don't, right. You know, I don't know the, there's definitely a possibility we could get half the fall season. Well, you imagine this good word. Yeah. Right. I mean, you imagine high school football locker rooms, right? I mean, that like yeah. compared to JJ, I think golf is the one that we keep thinking of, but you know, golf, tennis, the more individual sports where it's, it's easier to have people apart football, you're talking about 40 guys over here and 40 guys over here going to be running into each other for two hours, um, spitting all over each other in the best case scenarios, they're <laughs> spitting all over each other. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it's harder to see how that stuff will happen uninterrupted. Um, but I think also, at the end of the day, I understand sports fans, journalists, uh, high school football coaches, Rob Wygott, everyone wants some kind of certainty. But the reality is, you know, New York State is just starting this week, these antibody tests. And until those tests get rolled out nationwide, it could be that all three of us have had this virus and recovered from it. We don't know. Right. right. And right. so until they can roll that testing out in mass to say maybe the entire Polly and Wilson football teams have already had this and recovered from it. And yeah, they can go back and maybe start playing football. There's just right. not really, there's just so much still that's unknown. 
Um, and I think in 2020, it's hard for us to accept that something could be such a big story for months and months and we still don't know. Um, but I think that's the case. When you, I'm, I'm certain that you guys keep in touch with the coaches, uh, whatever. Are, are, is pretty much everybody on board with this? Do you talk to anyone who says, no, no, we got to get the kids back out there because that raises spirits, blah, blah, blah. It's been a mixed bag. I think a lot of people also feel that way and maybe don't feel comfortable saying it, especially yeah. on the record. Um, yeah, there, there's been a few coaches who are, uh, who are ready to go back to work right now. That's no kidding. Sure. Okay. So some, of the, some of the football coaches have been a little bit itchy. Um, I think specifically about – itchiness is not one of the symptoms, right? I can say they're itchy. Um, they're, they're a little bit – what they don't – what, I, what the, the biggest pushback that I hear, and I understand it, although I see both sides of it, is they don't want their season that would start in September to be canceled in April. They, you know, they're saying – don't take hope away, all this other stuff. Like, let's see how this plays out. And that was actually the position of the CIF state office. Um, they only canceled They only canceled the spring championships like two Fridays ago. Um, mm-hmm. They said, we want to let this play out as long as possible. And then it came to a point where the governor obviously said, we don't want schools open this year. Uh, and it was like, okay, well, <laughs> no school, no sports, you know. Um, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, I don't know. I, that, that's where I think we're, that's where I think the frustration that I see comes from more is like, they want people to wait. Now, the problem is you can't wait, right? You can't wait right. and say, oh, we're going to have the Grand Prix next weekend. It takes six months to ramp up to it and plan it. Um, and a high school football game is not quite as big as the Grand Prix. But similarly, like, they've got to have three weeks of practice together before they're playing high school football, right? Yeah. Like, we, it, th- these things do take uh, time and planning. And so some of those cancellations are happening, you know, fairly. I mean, the Olympics are canceled, right? It wouldn't have started until three and a half months from right now. Hey, speaking of football, we got the draft coming up. Are there any Long Beach, uh, former Long Beach players who are going to be probably drafted this year? We've got some uh, kind of fringe guys this year. Um, we, we don't have any like, you know, first day, first round, second round studs. But um, Zamari Manning from Wilson um, was the runner up for the Division II National Player of the Year Award um, at a, a school called Tarleton College. Um, okay. that records there, uh, our guy, uh, Kobe Williams from Poly and LBCC, uh, is at Arizona state. And I think we'll sign somewhere. And then Cedric bird, who's a Narbon kid who played at LBCC and then basically rewrote the record books at Hawaii. Um, I think you'll see him sign somewhere as well. So kind of a, you know, middling draft class for by Long Beach's standards because yeah. the city produced more <laughs> NFL players than, than any other city in the country. Um, but yeah, so we're still looking at three guys. I think we'll be, you know, seeing, seeing their lives change a little bit here. I hey, think the, spe- fa- I think the fascinating one is going to be the baseball draft because mm-hmm. the baseball draft has changed everything about it. They've changed the date. They've changed how many rounds there are. The baseball draft being shorter could actually keep quality baseball players in Long Beach longer because mm-hmm. there's a couple of guys who are kind of bubble guys. Uh, Adam Seminar is the Friday night starter, LJ Jones, the first baseman, um, these guys probably would have been like 20 something in the rounds, you know, 20, 21st, 22nd, they're not doing those rounds anymore. Right. So those guys with the uh, added eligibility that the NCAA is giving the spring, uh, spring student athletes, they could come back, not lose a year and also up their draft stock because right. they just weren't able to get drafted. Hey, speaking of the NFL draft, um, you guys have started something. You've done it twice. You're calling them the five, six, two classics. And the last one, this is an unbelievable football game between Polly and St. John Bosco. It really was kind of a sea change turn where Polly kind of last hurrah and Bosco started on this kind of unprecedented run of success. Um, I'm curious, guys, it, it, people, if you haven't seen these things, they're so much fun because basically they take the video that you saw, they, they add more to it. And then they pause it every now and then. And it's basically like when you watch your favorite movie, like Godfather Part Two, and Francis Ford Coppola is like talking to you about, well, here's how we shot this. And here's what happened to this guy. It's fantastic. The director's commentary. Yeah, It is my favorite thing right now. You know that. How did you guys come up with that idea? And are they as fun to put together as they are to watch? Yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun to put together because you forget about stuff. You know what I mean? We yeah. cover a lot of games. We're putting together a lot of videos. And even though these are some of the greatest games we've ever covered, like, for example, the football one, totally forgot that that video was seven minutes and it felt like three. Um, the next one we're doing is the uh, Drew League versus Goodman League. It's basically an all-star NBA game at Walter Pyramid in 2011 during the strike. 
They came in during the summer. And just watching that game and realizing, wow, we were watching Kevin Durant and James Harden before they were MVP quality guys, but they were still a big deal. It's stuff like that where it's like, man, I totally forgot that we were sitting three feet away from Kevin Durant. In the, in the tell, them, tell them who's in, that, who's in this video, the football video. What players? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, obviously, Juju Smith-Schuster uh, is the star of that game, of that season. Um, man, he just, took, he just took that game over. I said it in the video. It was this Al Bundy game. Like, he, he, just, he did everything you could possibly do to carry a team to victory. But he wasn't the only pro. You had Josh Rosen. Uh, Biggie Marshall and uh, Jayon Brown, also future NFLers. I think um, the, and then the other thing about the origins of it, Steve, we've wanted to do something like this for, I think we first started talking about it probably four or five years ago, Chase, right? Um, but it's just a question of during the school year, you're filming videos all the time. Um, right. You're putting stuff up. And then during the summer, you know, we basically get six weeks sort of between the school years. And you have the idea for it. And then you get into June 15th and you're like, well, I could take, my first weekend off in five months, or we could, <laughs> you know, sit next to each other in the core of this video. So we basically just never really had time to get to it. And um, kind of at your suggestion, actually, we're trying to use this time for us to say, look, we've been covering sports together here for 14 years. Um, we have a ton of knowledge. I mean, you know, JJ's got a, a great uh, grasp on Long Beach State and a lot of other history. Um, I've got a couple books out on the history of some of this stuff. So what have we wanted to do with these resources that we have that we haven't had time to do? Um, and yeah, it's, I, I, it's my favorite part of my week work-wise for sure. Um, and yeah, I think people really like the basketball one. Like JJ said, you've got the John Wall and James Harden and Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook and all these guys uh, hanging out in the pyramid together. Um, it was, it, yeah, that, that was pretty fun. And by the way, the very first two, the first one is a baseball game uh, with about a half a dozen people who end up in the in professional uh, professional baseball. That place takes place in 2012. The football game takes place in 2012. Was that just an insane year for? Long yeah, Beach? it really was. It was everything. Like Milliken won their historic uh, boys soccer championship in 2012. Uh, even like the Olympic stories in 2012 were part of that whole year we went to london in 2012 like it was a lot well steve the long beach athletes there are 26 athletes uh from long beach who competed in the olympics in 2012 um and they won i don't remember the raw totals but the gold medals won by these long beach athletes would have made this city of 500,000 people a top 15 country in the world in the gold medal count so it, it, it was like JJ and I joke about it all the time. 2012 was a real in a city that's had some unbelievable magical high points, the 50s, right. back to the 20s and everything else. 2012 was a pretty unique uh, and special year at every level for sure. 15. Hear that, Belgium? Eat our dust. Way to go. <laughs> so real quick, we said we were only going to talk 15 minutes about what's going on, but this has been great. Real quick, I think, you know, the number one team in town is always the Lakers. You guys talk some Lakers. Quick opinion, the long layoff, if they come back, if they come back, let's say they hey. come back, let's say they come back August. When they come back. When they come back, does it help <laughs> or hurt the oldest roster in the league? What do you think? I think it, I think it helps them, honestly. I mean, you look at a guy like LeBron who only gets better the longer he plays with guys. And so you're telling me that with, by my money, the top, a top three uh, guy in Anthony Davis, you're just going to give them more practice? He's just going to be able to get a more chemistry with that guy over the next few months, hopefully, if they're able to practice together. I right. think that in and of itself is good. They'll look better. Of course, Father Time is undefeated. And if you're right. just sitting at home, you're still getting old. The clock is running. Right. Like you would love it if the Lakers could play this championship in 2016, like, you know, as opposed to further down the calendar for sure. But yeah, I agree with JJ. I just think, um, you know, LeBron's the most cerebral guy in, in the league and in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think more time and for him, um, because he wasn't load managing and, and taking maybe as much time as some of us would even have liked to have seen him taking. Um, I think there's some benefit to that as well, you know, really get fresh and then come back and do a, a sprint, you know, to decide some kind of a championship. I, I will say the NBA has signaled pretty clearly that, um, they're planning on doing whatever they need to do to crown some kind of a champion for this year. Um, I just think they played too many games to just end it, you know, on 
okay, cool. We'll do it again next year. You know what I mean? I mean, think about like Anthony Davis, is a free agent next year, you know, but, so the dominant storyline of Lakers and Clippers and all this other stuff, if they just chuck the season, who knows what we're looking at next year. By the but way, if you're talking about the playoffs, things, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. If you're talking about the playoffs, think about how much travel that is. Yeah. So what are you going to do? You're going to send all these teams to one location and do like a summer league tournament. Yes. Yep, right. you, you, you can't travel people. So that the right. logistics of that would be insane. And also the NBA would be basically asking their employees to risk their own health and safety. Right. Yeah. But, I, but, and I think, but I think, I think you're describing exactly what they're going to do. I think we'll see some kind of a tournament in Vegas where the players are asked to go and stay there for a month in a more or less sealed environment where they and their families and everyone else have, have to be tested to go through. Um, and I, I, to be honest, that's really the only, I, you're right. There's no way you're flying from LA to Boston for a freaking playoff game, even on a private jet. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, I mean, I think that's, I, I think that's what it would have to look like. And we have seen leagues explore that major league baseball's uh, floated the idea of an Arizona, Arizona only uh, league, you know, this year. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that the NBA said that's really encouraging is, they know everyone wants this to happen. So they're like, if we need to play it August and September and then start next year in January, that's something we're willing to look into doing. Um, well, and and I think a lot of people, already, fan, I appreciate it. A lot of people already think the NBA should start on Christmas day anyways. Right. And go to a, yes. like a 60 game. It is one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Remember, remember the strike year when they, it was like 50 games and mm-hmm. every game meant something. That's like the best year they've ever had. Yeah. You know, Hey, speaking of basketball, last thing, we got about a minute or two left. The last dance premiered yesterday. What do you guys think? Uh, I think nothing's ever going to touch the uh, O.J. Simpson Made in America documentary for me as far as sports documentaries. But uh, the last dance, the first two hours is pretty spectacular. And Mm -hmm. I I went from being like 10 hours is an awful lot of time to, wow, how are they only going to do 10 hours on this? I mean, I just... To see a team that JJ and I were both like 13, 14 for that 97, 98 season, and that we were surrounded, you know, that was the first mass media team in a lot of ways, those, yes. those the MJ Bulls teams. So I didn't think, and I, I was a Jordan fanatic. I wore holes in all the VHSs. Um, I didn't think there was any way to have new stuff about Michael Jordan and the Bulls. And, you know, kudos to ESPN for letting them cuss, actually. I think that that made a huge difference for me. You hear Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan actually having conversations, you know. Um, It's been really uh, incredible, and I can't believe they sat on the footage for 22 years. Um, But, yeah, I I think it's going to be really special. I I just – my favorite thing I've watched uh, during the shutdown so far, way better than Tiger King, I'll say that. (laughs) I don't know, Mike. I don't know. I, I love the background information on the guys not named Michael Jordan. Like the stuff about Scotty, I absolutely love that. That that, I didn't that know inside any of that about information. Scottie. I had no idea. I had no idea. That was that was my favorite part. Scotty's talking Mike, about he took, he took this terrible contract, this seven year, $18 million deal that when he was a top five player in the league made him the 122nd highest paid. So while my dad was paralyzed. And my brother was paralyzed and we came from a really poor family in Arkansas. And uh, I didn't know that Scotty walked on at an NAIA school, by the way, Crazy, <laughs> you know, and then grew seven inches between his freshman and sophomore year. So, yeah, I mean, again, I saw Scotty Pippen probably five times a week that year. Mm-hmm. But you just, the storytelling is just different. No one was sending a camera crew to central Arkansas <laughs> to get this footage, you know. <laughs> Yeah, Mike, you got to tell the Space Jam story real quick before we go. This, yep. Steve, you're going to love this story. Okay. okay. So when I was a kid, as I mentioned, I was a Jordan fanatic. I mean, just like, you know, begged for six months for the starter jacket, like Bulls jacket, right? Like drank Gatorade every day, made my grandma buy me Wheaties when I stayed with her, like just total nutcase for Michael Jordan. So uh, I found out in elementary school that they were going to be filming Space Jam at Blair Field. That's where the baseball scenes in Space Jam were filmed at Blair Field. So uh, my girlfriend, my elementary school girlfriend, uh, whose parents were both uh, influential people in the city, uh, she got us extras tickets to Blair Field to go and sit in the stands. We got free popcorn, free hot dogs, free drinks. Obviously, adults know, uh, JJ knows, extra work is not necessarily glamorous, but we thought it was Truth. And at the end of the filming, Michael Jordan, if you've ever been to Blair Field, you know, there's sort of the grandstands are, you know, shaped along the baselines and, and behind home plate. So he just walked the 
the, the, around the, you know, the bottom of the stands and just put his hand out to high five people. And I seeing that this was happening, ran down those metal steps at Blair and then just full on like stage dive <laughs> onto these th three rows of other elementary school kids in front of me in order to reach out and graze the tip of Michael Jordan's hand. <laughs> if you can't be great, be close. That's it's, right. like the, it's like the Michelangelo thing, God and Adam, right? Yeah. I yeah. have a similar story, but it's about Stevie Nicks. But we can talk about that. <laughs> True story. Hollywood Bowl. Stevie, I'm waiting for you. Hey, guys, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. This was fun. It was great, Absolutely, Steve. Steve. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Tomorrow, uh, I believe Melissa Evans and Kelly Puente, I think, will be speaking with um, Long Beach Fire Chief about things that are going on. I don't think they'll be talking about Michael Jordan or Stevie Nicks, but you never know. <laughs> so you got to tune in to find out. Thanks a lot for being here. We'll see you later.